We began last week looking at a review of my lesson during the lectureship on realized eschatology. Because in that lesson and dealing with the end of the Law of Moses and when it ends, I had mentioned the passage Micah 3 and verse 12, which states, Therefore shall Zion for your sake be plowed as a field, and Jerusalem shall become heaps and the mountain of the house of the high places of the forest. Two individuals, uh, Hogler Neubauer and Steve Baisden, attempted in an hour-long video to answer uh, my lesson as they did every other lesson during the lectureship. They spent an hour on each one. And after viewing their lesson on mine, I haven't really looked at the others, but if the others are like that, I can certainly understand why they do not want to debate the subject. Um, they would be totally lost. But their view, the realized eschatologist's view on the law of Moses and when it ended, is that the law of Moses did not end at the cross and Pentecost, but instead it continued on until the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70. They call it an overlapping of the covenant. And they thus, one of their key passages in understanding that would be in Matthew 5, verse 17 and 18. Think not that I am come to destroy the law of the prophets, I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law, till all be fulfilled. And their twisted views, because they look at that and state, till heaven and earth, that phrase, heaven and earth, they have redefined as Judaism. Now then, guess what happens when you read that in Genesis 1 and verse 1? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Guess what that is? That's not the beginning of this physical material universe. You need to know, realize that. You all probably didn't realize that before now. It's not the beginning of this physical world. Instead, it's the beginning of Judaism. <laughs> that is the view which they are espousing. But when you come back to thus Matthew 5, 17 and 18, in their view, every detail of the old law has to be fulfilled before the law of Christ can come into existence. Now, in reality, they violate their own principle because they have the law of Christ coming in at uh, Acts, the second chapter, Pentecost. And yet they have the law of Moses continuing in 87, and it can't be taken out of the way till everything within the law has been fulfilled. And since everything was was not fulfilled by the time of Acts second chapter, thus the law continued to AD 70. But I mentioned that that really gives them very little comfort, and I mentioned this last week, Daniel the second chapter gives four world empires. And there is going to be a stone cut out of the mountain without hands in verse 34, and that's giving the explanation of Nebuchadnezzar's dream in verse 44 that is going to strike the image on the feet and it's going to destroy the image and it's going to fill the earth. Now that stone that's cut out of the mountain without hands was the establishment of the church and how that the church would strike the Roman Empire and destroy it and thus, representatively, all of those empires, but uh, it would be the Roman Empire. That didn't take place till the 5th century. 
So they had to invent another way in which to try and answer that, but that's not our lesson this evening. Because I wanted to center upon the, what they said in relationship to Micah 3 and verse 12. It therefore shall Zion for your sakes be plowed as a field, and Jerusalem shall become as heaps, the mountain of the house as high places of the forest. And notice that phrase that Jerusalem or Zion would be plowed as a field. Now there is a limited fulfillment in the immediate historical situation with Nebuchadnezzar and the destroying of Jerusalem in 586. We don't disagree with that. But ha however, the true and complete fulfillment is not until 135 uh, and the time of the Simon bar Coca, or some has it, Kosaba, and as I mentioned last week, it's, I've seen it written down several different ways, but his rebellion against the Romans. And the Jews had made a, an attempt to rebuild Jerusalem and the temple. And we'll get into more, more of this in uh, just a moment. But in 132 through 135, this is 65 years after the destruction of Jerusalem, though. So, of course, they cannot have it ap applying to that. And so we began looking at their response, and basically they used three arguments. The first of those is Jeremiah's quote, and we looked at that last week. The context is not that Jeremiah is quoting Micah. In fact, it wasn't Jeremiah. It was the elders of the land were making an argument that Hezekiah did not put Micah to death for making such a prophecy. Thus, the application is we should not put Jeremiah to death for the prophecies that he's making. Uh, and yet that's what they wanted to do. The second argument, or not in order, but uh, that I want to deal with, is the idea of someone plowing in Jerusalem. Hogler Neubauer in this video claimed that if I saw someone plowing in Jerusalem today, I would say, see, it's still being fulfilled. Is there anyone really who cannot understand the difference between someone plowing in Jerusalem and Jerusalem being plowed? The scripture says that Jerusalem is going to be plowed, not someone plowing in Jerusalem. There is a vast difference between those two statements. But in the lesson, and I've mentioned already, the Simon Bar Kokhba or Kokhba, uh, revolt. A couple of matters regarding this, the fulfillment of this prophecy. As I mentioned, the original context obviously is the destruction of Jerusalem by Nebuchadnezzar in 586 B.C. When you're dealing with prophecy, Rex Turner expressed it this way, that prophets, prophets, quote, prophets often saw the future as one would view a mountain range with the peaks being in the scope of their vision and the valleys being left out. End quote. And so if you can imagine standing on a mountain or a hill and you see this peak and this peak and this peak and this peak, several different peaks out here. You don't see the valleys in between, but you do see the peaks. That's the way in which prophecy is. It's getting the peaks and talking about these peaks out here that you would see. And so this aspect of Jerusalem being plowed as a field is not literally accomplished or fulfilled until the Romans did it after putting down this Simon Bar Kokhba res, uh, revolt some seven centuries after Micah gives this. 
Now let me mention, the, and we're going to deal a lot with history now in relationship to this because a lot of times we never have studied this aspect. The events leading up to the, to the revoked. Hadrian had become Caesar in 118. Originally, he was going to be very conducive to the Jews and he was going to allow them to rebuild the temple. However, because of some comments that were made to him, how that Jerusalem had been rebellious, and if he allows this, they would rebel again, he went back on his word. And he then started, instead of being favorable to the Jews, he basically turned against them he requested that the site of the temple actually be moved. And so they were going to have to move the actual temple from one place to another place. He then began deporting the Jews from that area and that region off to, no to North Africa. Well, at that time, and when he goes back upon his word, starts being unfavorable to them, the Jews started making preparations for a rebellion. It began in 132 when these individuals began making surprise attacks against the Romans. Hadrian, being Caesar and the emperor of the world at this time, brought a legion of men and he then forbade circumcision. Uh, he put it in a broader term that would include circumcision. Well, of course, to the Jews, that was the sign of the covenant. Uh, that was something that they just, uh, that was beyond their, their dreams. And so Hadrian left in 132, and the, the Jews began then rebelling on a larger scale. Under Simon Bar Kokhba, and by the way, some of the priests at that time even referred to him as the Messiah. Yeah. And thus shows the esteem that they held for Simon. But under Simon, the Jews captured about 50 strongholds of the Romans and 985 undefeated or undefended towns and villages, including Jerusalem. By the very number of 50 strongholds, 985 towns, you start seeing the extent of this rebellion it wasn't just some small thing over here. The Jews from other places and some Gentiles joined in with the rebellion. During that time, they started minting coins even, which, uh, and there's some discrepancies as to exactly what all was printed on the coins, but one of them was, quote, the freedom of Israel. Well, you know that Hadrian and the Roman Empire is not going to stand for such. So Hadrian dispatched General Publius Marcellus who was governor of Syria to help Rufus, but the Jews defeated both of these leaders. And so again, you start saying this isn't just a small rebellion. This was something that was fairly major. He finally sent one of his best generals from Britain, Julius Servius along with a former governor of Germania, Hadrianus Quintus Lolius Urbicus. 
And if I'm butchering these names, uh, you can understand why maybe now. <laughs> but he dispenses or sends these two individuals, the best you know, general that he has along with this former governor. But by that time in which he sends them, there were 12 army legions from Egypt, Britain, Syria, and other areas all have come to Jerusalem to quell this rebellion. Finally, they demolished all of the 50 strongholds, then recaptured the 985 villages. The Romans, though, and you learn this through history, the winners of a war are the ones who write the history of the war. Doesn't necessarily mean that it's always true, but they still are the ones who write it. The Romans actually suffered very heavy casualties. You don't read that so much in Hadrian's reports back to the Romans, uh, but they did. They were suffered heavy casualties. The final battle in the war took place in Bethar. Now, Bethar was Simon Bar Kokobah's headquarters. It also housed the Sanhedrin, which was the Jewish high court, and the home of the Mesa, which were the leaders. So ha you have them all coming down or coming back to Bethar, and that's where the final battle takes place. But as I say, the Romans have suffered greatly during this battle. The very fact that he had to bring all of these generals, all of these legions of people in order to, to, to put down this rebellion, they're not a happy lot. Would you be? <laughs> so they're rather upset with the Jews. Their solution to the Jewish problem thus is that Hadrian wanted to wipe out even the memory of the Jewish people. Now that is someone who is mad. He, uh, he is upset, uh, or maybe furious might be a better term. But to do that, he has to destroy Jerusalem as well. He issues a decree to literally outlaw Judaism on pain of death. So if you embrace Judaism, the Jewish religion, you're put to death. That is his, part of his solution. If you taught the Torah, the Torah is the law. law you're dealing with the law of Moses, it would also embrace, even though the Torah did not specifically embrace the prophets and the, old, the rest of the Old Testament. But if you taught that, again, you were put to death. He renamed Jerusalem. Can't have the name Jerusalem if you're wanting to wipe it out of people's memory. So he renamed it and I, again, I'll probably uh, butcher this one, but Aelia Capitonelia. Uh, he also forbade any of the Jews from living there. So rename the city, kick out every Jew, you cannot live here. But now then, specifically in relationship to the prophecy of Micah 3.12. Now that's the background to this prophecy. That Jerusalem or Zion would be plowed as a field. 
because Hadrian then employed an army of slaves to literally plow over the Temple Mountain. To the Romans, if they were wanting to wipe out an area, make it basically unlivable, they would plow it with salt. Now you can imagine uh, what salt will do to the land. And if you're living off of the land and it's plowed with salt, you're not going to survive very long in that area. Well, apparently in this case, they didn't apply the salt all that well. But through their plowing of the Temple Mountain, they lowered it a thousand feet. Today, the mountains around the Temple Mountain are actually taller Mount Olives and Mount Scopius that would be around where the temple resided, they're taller than where the temple was. But before Hadrian, Mount Moriah, where the temple was, where the temple stood, was the highest mountain there. But no longer. Why? Because during that revolt, of Simon Bar Kokhba and Hadrian's anger and trying to destroy Judaism from off the face of the earth, he lowered that temple mountain a thousand feet. He unleashed an eight to ten year reign of persecution that was unmatched in Jewish history. Now then, after Hadrian's death, his successor, Antonius uh, Pius, overturned his decrees, and he became actually benevolent toward the Jews. But you had Jerusalem, and thus when Micah comes along and says Jerusalem would be plowed as a field, not someone simply plowing in Jerusalem. The city literally was plowed by slaves and they lowered Mount Moriah a thousand feet. Now that's a huge amount. Um, that's plowing Jerusalem like a field. That's why we say there in Micah 3 and verse 12 that it was not really fulfilled until Micah seeing that mountaintop of prophecy down at 135 A.D. and that destruction by Hadrian of Jerusalem. Now then, there's one other argument that they made, and we'll spend the rest of the time this afternoon on this argument, and that is what I'm going to call the next verse. Micah 3 and verse 12, that's the last verse of Micah th chapter 3. Chapter 4 and verse 1 then says, But in the last days it shall come to pass that the mountain of the, of the house of the Lord shall be established in the top of the mountain, and it shall be exalted above the hills, and people shall flow into it. Now then, to set up their argument, they look at that verse and they state, since this verse immediately follows Micah 3.12, our text, and it is joined with the word but in chapter 4 and verse 1, that the plowing of the field must have taken place prior to Micah 4 and verse 1. Uh, Hogler Neubauer was the one presenting this, and Steve Bazden, when he said that, said, oh, that's a good point. Well, that, he used the word excellent observation. The question is, does that principle 
which he's trying to state, a principle that since this verse follows what I had stated in Micah 3.12, thus Micah 3.12 had to be fulfilled before chapter 4 and verse 1. Does that principle hold true? If it does, then they've made a valid point. Question is, does it? And the answer is no. Just going to look at one verse. Turn over to Isaiah, the seventh chapter. And in Isaiah 7, you have a situation. Here's Ahab. And God has sent Isaiah to Ahaz because there's two kings over here. Reason, king of Syria, and Pekah, king of Israel. They were going to go to war against Jerusalem. Jerusalem, the king of Jerusalem at the time, was Ahaz. Ahaz. So God tells Isaiah, go to Ahaz. Tell him he doesn't have anything to fear from these two kings and from thus the two nations that are coming to war against Jerusalem. Because they're not going to succeed in destroying Jerusalem. Now then, in order to assure Ahaz of the truthfulness of this, and also to allow Ahaz to know, you don't need to run down to Egypt for help because that's what he was planning. So you don't need to do that. God is promising you these two nations, they're not going to succeed. How do I know that? Well, Ahaz could have asked that, but he doesn't. God says for assurance to, so that you will know the truthfulness of this, you can ask for any sign whatsoever. Now, the word sign, as used in Isaiah 7 there, is dealing with a miracle. Ask for any miracle that you want. Doesn't matter what it is, and I'll do it so that you will know that these two nations, Syria and Israel, who have joined forces, are not going to succeed in destroying Jerusalem. And that miracle will be evidence of their, their failure. Ahaz, with a feigned sincerity, says, oh no, I wouldn't ask God something like that. I wouldn't tempt him in that way. Well, the problem with that is that would not be tempting God since God told him to do it, for one thing. God says, you ask, I'm going to provide you this so that you will know the, the situation. Ahaz really doesn't care because he's already made his plans. I'm going down to Egypt and getting them to help. So God says, even though Ahaz has refused, I'm going to give you a sign. This sign is not to Ahaz, though, it's to the house of David. Now, let's read, starting in Isaiah 7, starting in verse 14, because that sets the background to, to this. Therefore, the Lord himself shall give you a sign. So here's God now giving them a sign. What is it? Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. Now that is a direct prophecy relating to the birth of Messiah, the Christ. God is giving a sign, what? A miracle. This is not going to be an ordinary birth. It's going to be a birth of a virgin is going to give birth. Well, that's going to be miraculous birth thus. And Matthew 1 shows us that the birth of Jesus is the fulfillment of this that, my, that Isaiah states here in Isaiah 
and we could spend a great deal of time dealing with that virgin birth uh, and some of the arguments that are presented as to an immediate fulfillment. Why? Because there's an immediate situation. And some have questioned, well, how is the fulfillment of a prophecy some 700 years in the future going to give assurance to Ahaz at this time that these two nations are not going to succeed? Well, number one, it's, it tells the house of David, not necessarily Ahaz, that Israel, the, or Jerusalem, is going to continue on. And that that seed line is going to continue on. It's not going to be destroyed. Thus, these two nations are not going to succeed. But now then, God also gives a time frame. There's a time element dealing with these two nations and reason and pika. Notice verse 15 and 16. Butter and honey shall he eat, that he may know to refuse the evil and choose the good. For before the child shall know to refuse the evil and choose the good, the land that thou abhorrest shall be forsaken of both her kings. Now there's a time element. What's the time? The time before a child can grow to the point of developing what we call an age of accountability is being taught here, but where he can discern to refuse the evil and choose the good before he can know to have a knowledge to make those decisions. So within that time frame, these two nations that thou abhorrest they're going to be forsaken of reason and peak. Now then, notice that the time element, though, is tied directly to the virgin birth and comes immediately after the virgin birth prophecy. Taking the position that they have set forth, that since a passage is tied to the previous verse that the previous verse has to be fulfilled prior to the succeeding verses. Taking that and applying it to Isaiah 7, 14 through 16, Jesus had to be born before reason and Pekah were destroyed. Jesus was born during the 7th century B.C. Now, how did you, that's the principle. If that principle is true, and thus Micah 3 and verse 12 had to be fulfilled before, actually they would say the destruction of Jerusalem, or in the destruction of Jerusalem, then Jesus had to be born during the 7th century B.C. That simply shows... And this one passage by itself, because we all know that Jesus was not born in the 7th century B.C. He was looking 700 years after the fact in which Jesus would be born, yet he gives a time frame in the very next two verses of reason and Pekah's destruction and being forsaken, or the lands being forsaken. Thus, their argument to try and offset Micah 3 and verse 12 being fulfilled in the rebellion of Simon in 135 by using Micah 4 and verse 1 and following as being the church is simply false. It's a wrong interpretation. And thus, you still have that problem that they are presented with that not everything was fulfilled by AD 70. And if the law of Moses could not be fulfilled or could not 
be taken out of the way until every little thing of the Old Testament is fulfilled, guess what? They're going to have to have the law of Moses continuing past AD 70 and on to at least 135, and in reality, on past that into the 5th century. When uh, Rome was destroyed. But the fact of the matter is, the law of Moses ended at the cross. The effects of that did not take place until Acts, the second chapter, in which the law of Christ comes into being. And at the time of the law of Christ coming into being, the, that first testament is taken out of the way so he could establish the second. And we today, as everyone, is now under the law, the law of Christ and not the law of Moses. There was no overlapping of the covenants. They were subject to one or the other. And God saw fit, even 700 years before the time, to prophesy of this virgin birth of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ who had come to be the God with us, the Emmanuel. That's what it means. And that's what is prophesied there in Isaiah 7, 14. God manifested in the flesh, God with us, and we're going to be, we are subject to his law, to his will. Whether or not we obey it is our decision, but we're going to stand before him and we're going to be judged one way or the other based upon whether we accept his law and obey it or whether we refuse and disobey. So if you're not a Christian this afternoon, we would encourage you to become such. To obey the law of Christ so that you can become a Christian and be saved. If you obeyed the gospel, you're a Christian, but you're not living the way that Christ wants you to live. Why not come back into him this afternoon? Repent of your sins and make things right with him so that you can have that eternal salvation. If you need to come, do so as we stand and sing the invitation song.